In the early hours of January 24th, 1978, people saw something strange fall out of the sky. No one knew exactly what it was or where it came from, but they can tell something was up. Am I going to see my kids again? Am I going to see my mom and dad? I'm Denizen Ake Kong. This is Operation Morning Light, a new eight-part series. Listen wherever you get your podcasts. This podcast is intended for mature audiences. Listener discretion is advised. A bizarre case of murder, sexual abuse, and alleged law enforcement misconduct is unfolding here. And it questions the innocence of children, a police officer, and the legal system. Few people question the Kerr children's claims of sexual abuse, but it's the stories of devil worshiping and satanic sacrifice that have some wondering if the children may have been led or prompted into saying those things by adults. You don't believe there have been satanic rituals? Nobody, in nobody found any kind of evidence to show that they would. If they have, they're not making it public. For the past two years, Sergeant James Brown has been the only investigator on the Wilson case. It was a job he volunteered for. Now he's a suspect in her disappearance. So our last episode was all about Raymond Smith, the little boy who falsely accused his mom and stepdad of being in a satanic cult, of murdering Kelly Wilson, the teenager who vanished on January 5th, 1992, from the town square in Gilmer. Two years after Kelly disappeared, just to quickly recap, Special Prosecutor Scott Lyford and his pair of investigators, Steve Baggs and Brooks Flagg, convinced a grand jury to indict eight people for the kidnapping, rape, and murder of Kelly. The suspects included Gilmer Police Sergeant James York Brown and Raymond's parents, Don and Tammy. They were facing death penalty offenses, but there were big problems with Lyford's case. Here's Kelly's mom, Kathy on the local news. I feel like he'll have to prove it in order for us, the family, to believe to believe that he's going to have to prove it beyond a shadow of a doubt that this has all happened and that the people are involved with Kelly's disappearance and murder. We've got to maintain objectivity. And they're going to have to have more than circumstantial evidence. And they haven't shown us anything. Special Prosecutor Scott Lyford's case against Sergeant Brown and his co-defendants most of the members of the Kerr family hinged on the witness statements of Raymond and Connie Martin, the common-law wife of one of the Kerr brothers. With a little help from Connie's sister-in-law, Wanda. If Scott Lyford had the goods, though, he was keeping the details to himself. I really am not comfortable talking about the evidence at this point. And Connie Martin has not been charged because she's cooperating with us. Another star witness for the Lyford team had already recanted. Wanda's brother, Lucas. A new setback to Lyford's case is Lucas Gear, a Kerr family uncle. Gear is currently serving time in prison on child molestation charges. In the search warrant, Gear is listed as a cooperating witness to the children's accounts of satanic rituals and human sacrifice. He passed a polygraph test. But now Gear says he lied. They kept, kept nagging. Like they wanted something. They wanted me to go along with them. Otherwise, they would lead me on. So I had to lead them on to them. Enter Shane Phelps, Assistant Attorney General for the state of Texas. Now the Texas Attorney General's office has stepped in. Assistant Attorneys General Shane Phelps and Lisa Turner are conducting the investigation and working with the grand jury. Reviewing the case files, Shane Phelps and his assistant prosecutor, Lisa Tanner, knew what they had to do. Shane had to drop the charges and clear Sergeant Brown's name. By this time, Sergeant Brown had already been released after spending six days in the county jail. To cover his bond, Sergeant Brown's dad put up the family farm as surety, but the city council had already voted to suspend Sergeant Brown from the police department. No pay, no job. Sergeant Brown was so broke, he put his own mobile home and pickup truck on the market. As for the Kerrs and Raymond's parents, his mom Tammy and stepdad Don, they had it even worse. They were still behind bars. I'll never forget being in jail and going into the courtroom to be arraigned. That's Tammy. I turned myself in. I mean, I'll just never forget how shocked 
I was like, what in the hell is going on? You know, I mean, it was just crazy. And that was the first time you see us coming out in the orange suits. And that was what was on my mind. I was like, I cannot believe that that just happened. You just feel like you're in a movie. You know what I mean? You just don't even feel like it's real. You just can't believe. And all I kept thinking is, these are smart, intelligent people. You know, because I, like I said, I, I had all trust in our government. I had all trust in our system. Police officers who do the right thing, do what they say. They're going to figure this all out. They're smart, educated people. Come on. Uh-uh. It, did, it just kept getting stupider, worse. I mean, they had like, when they would interrogate me, they would have pictures of skulls on the table, you know, trying to convince me that I had had these babies and sacrificed them to the devil. And I was just like, what in the heck is going on here? My lawyer's sitting there going, now, Tammy, they're going to give you a deal and give you your kids back in six months if you just tell them what happened. And, it, and I said, Mike, I don't even know what all the other girls are saying if I did want to take the deal. And he sat there and told me. He sat there and told me what the other girls were. And I'm like, I am praying and asking God to get me out of this crap. I ain't lying on that one person. And so don't ask me again to do that. And because my own lawyer tried to get me to lie and say stuff. This is bull crap. When your own lawyer is telling you to confess, confess on Dawn and, and lie on Dawn. And since I'm so much younger, you know, I'm going to get off. And then we'll fly around and do a book deal. You know, this is my lawyer telling me this crap. I'm like, geez, I can't trust anybody, literally. Did any of this that they alleged actually happen? Absolutely none. Absolutely. I am not ever met Kelly Wilson, not once. I've never molested my children. When she was first locked up, Tammy didn't believe her son Raymond would ever accuse her of such horrible crimes. After he got in foster care, my lawyer at the time, the good one, <laughs> I can't even think of the name, he said, Tammy, unfortunately, he said, Raymond is a smart kid and he will be their star witness. And I went, no. Raymond is a Kurt gun boy. He will not lie. He, Tammy, yes, he will. You know, that, that was my lawyer telling me he was, you know, he's being honest with me, Tammy. They're going to convert him or whatever because he's smart and they're going to make him their star witness. And I'd be darned if he wasn't right. <laughs> I remember one time being in jail and one of the guys, his books, Brooks flag, they let him come in my cell, my one man cell. I saw, and he touches my hand and he goes, how does it feel to know you're never going to know the touch of a man? And I just thought, and then he looks up at my wall and, you know, in jail, you take toothpaste and you stick your pictures on the, on the wall. And he goes, I see you're getting used to your new home. He goes, you're going to have a good Merry Christmas, aren't you? And he walks out. I mean, I just couldn't believe that people were really like that. That's how innocent and naive I was. <laughs> One time I was brought into this room and I'll never forget all these big men, big men. And, and there was probably like seven or eight of them. And they set me down. They're all looking at me like mean mugging me. And they turn on this uh, TV and they go, we want you to watch this. And I sat down and there's my little Raymond. His head's all shaved completely. He's sitting in a chair, and Ann Gore is on her knees in front of him, asking him questions. Did your mama, and, and he's putting his hands in his mouth, and he's mumbling, and she says, did your mama do that? And you can tell she's like suggestive questioning him over and over and over. And them guys are just looking at me like, you are sick. You ought to be, you know, I'm just sitting there crying, thinking, what is this? What, what are they doing to my baby? You know, that's when I realized my kids are not safe where they're at. <laughs> you know, <laughs> this isn't what I thought it was anymore. 
for some reason, I always had faith in God that it was just going to get better. I always had that faith that it was going to get better. I just couldn't believe, though, that all the lies, you know, how these people had so much control and they lie so bad. <laughs> and then everybody else just lets them. I mean, judges, I remember being in court and Barbara Bass and them talking about how they kept getting these threats and everything. And I'm thinking, we're in jail. How can we threaten you? Oh, you know, they were calling us. We can't call you unless you accept the phone call. I mean, there would be records of all this stuff. And they're saying all these lies in court. And I'm thinking, why isn't anybody doing anything? Why is this judge sitting here allowing these lies when he freaking knows better? I mean, I just couldn't, I couldn't grasp it. And I still can't grasp it. The lurid details and sensational indictments swept East Texas. It was all anybody could talk about. This case still has many people in Gilmer riveted to the goings-on at the courthouse and wondering if there will ever be a resolution to the mystery. Every day on the news, we were on the news. Every day, for two years, on the news. Top story, it was either Tanya Harding or, <laughs> or us. Tanya Harding had nothing on this. From Imperative Entertainment, I'm Wes Ferguson. This is Devil Town. If you think cash back at thousands of your favorite stores sounds too good to be true, think again. With Rakuten, you can save on whatever you're buying for the holidays. So while you're getting gifts for friends and family, get some cash back for yourself, too. Don't forget festive home decor, party outfits, and that trip to see your fam. Because shopping for everything is much more magical with cash back. Rakuten makes it so easy. Here's how it works. Rakuten partners with stores you know and love. Places like American Eagle, Aveda, Finish Line, GameStop, Lancome and more. These stores actually pay Rakuten for sending them shoppers, and Rakuten shares that money with you as cash back. You can even stack coupons and deals on top of cash back. Cha-ching! Shop at Rakuten.com or by using the Rakuten app and you'll get your cash back payments through PayPal or check. It's that easy. Start your holiday shopping with Rakuten now to save money at over 3,500 stores. Join for free at Rakuten.com or get the Rakuten app. That's R-A-K-U-T-E-N. Rakuten.com. Good evening. Something scary happened yesterday. Something science fiction buffs have been telling us for years was going to happen. In the early hours of January 24th, 1978, people saw something strange fall out of the sky. No one knew exactly what it was or where it came from, but they can tell something was up. They said, well, we'd like your help on something. This is very confidential. You can't talk to anybody about it. Am I going to see my kids again? Am I going to see my mom and dad? I'm Denizen Ake Kum, and this is the untold story of what really happened back in 1978 and how that light in the sky is still impacting my home and my people 44 years later. This is Operation Morning Light, a new eight-part series from Imperative Entertainment and Vespucci. Follow and listen wherever you get your podcasts. This is Chapter 6, Courtroom Drama. Here's Raymond's stepdad, Don Holman. I, I went to a church for about three and a half years that you couldn't go to the Amboree. The Amboree is the fall festival in Gilmer. It's a lot like any county fair. Parade, Queen's Court, livestock show, if you throw in a lot of yams. Don is a self-described Bible thumper. His church back then was so strict, he couldn't even have fun at the Yamboree. You can't watch showbiz pizza. You can't go on a trip without asking and getting permission from the preacher. And I'm not that type. I was a sergeant in the army. I mean, I told people what to do in a nice way, but they come and ask me, hey, Holman, uh, listen, my wife, I think my wife's running around on me. Would you help me out, you know? Yeah, send her a dozen roses and apologize if you cheating bastard. <laughs> <laughs> 
you know, I've been around. I've been a cop before in Big Sandy back when Texas largest manhunt. I was the good guy. And then all of a sudden I'm in jail going, I kill, kill an eight, a 17 year old girl and sacrifice 10 babies to the devil. And uh, I mean, just hateful things to me and put me in a dorm with a bunch of idiots. I'm not saying idiots, they was all right after I threatened to kill them, you know. But one had, I kept up with him and he got 75 years for murder, 19 year old black guy. Another one, he had tattoos, had his head shaved on each side. Me and him used to get a water igloo and work out with it. We got along, with, I got along with everybody. Oh, and one, one boy walked, uh, was in there in that holding cell. This guy said, what's that all about? Who's that guy? And he goes, oh, that's one of them old charmless and curs. And when he said that, I walked over to him. I said, bang, bang, bang. I said, come here. I said, you see that name right there? I said, my name is Don Holman, not Kerr. Don't call me a cur. And he go, okay, huh? I wasn't going to hurt the guy, but from then on, when he walked my, my jail cell, he put his head down. <laughs> you don't, I mean, you don't call me no charm lester. When uh, you said you lost a bunch of weight, was that? Fasting. I fasted not to show off. I fasted to God. And when they asked me, I'll go get you a cheeseburger or whatever, won't you want to eat? And I said, ma'am, listen, please. I said, I'm not doing this to be stubborn headed. I, I, I appreciate anything you do. But I said, I can't. This is something I got to deal with. And uh, I asked one of them, I said, you know what I'm in here? And she said, not really. I said, they're saying I'm a rapist and a murderer and a child molester, and they said, what? And I said, yeah. And I said, and I've got to get in touch with God. Humbled, it, I mean, it's David said, I humbled my soul with fasting. So fasting, and, and he doesn't turn away the humble. Don had a long history with the Kerr clan, the local family whose incest and child abuse got tangled up with the search for Kelly Wilson. Don says he was not particularly close to Wendell, the Kerr brother who was first convicted of abusing his own kids, which is how the case against the entire family got started. But Don says he and Wendell talked in lockup after they were both arrested. So when Wendell was telling you about the, some stuff about his own dad, was that when y'all were in, in jail? What did he say? Well, um... <clears throat> I hate to I hate to say this. I really do because it relates to Wendell, and I don't like to tell on him for what he was already done wrong. But he said his daddy used to sodomize him. I said, "Well, Wendell, does he do it anymore?" He said, "Well, what I would do, I'd go out and work, and he said I'd just take the money home and give it to him." He said, after a while, I, he said, I said, no more. You're not doing this no more. And he said, I got mad. And he didn't do it no more. I said, Wendell, let me tell you something. You're not to hold that against you. It's whether you go do somebody else like that. I said, you couldn't help that. Did, did Wendell say how old he was when he was getting abused? By young, him? young. Probably like in grade school. Wendell, the abused, became the abuser. He was also a truck driver, the one who had shipping receipts which proved he'd been hauling freight on the East Coast when Kelly disappeared. The receipts even had Wendell's own signature on them. Although members of Scott Lyford's team were convinced that Wendell was a master Satanist who'd forged the receipts, it should have been obvious to anyone else that Wendell had done no such thing. Whatever his other crimes, Wendell, who died in 2018, was innocent in the murder of Kelly Wilson. No grand juries indict based on probable cause, but there wasn't probable cause. And they acknowledged that. Lyford acknowledged that to me. That's Shane Phelps again. Credible witness statements can be enough, but this was outlandish stuff. 
I don't think there's a prosecutor in the state of Texas who has any sense of what prosecution is about, whoever would have indicted that case. If for nothing else, for the fear of, I'm going to get my ass handed to me in court. Because it didn't take long uh, for their case just to fall apart. Shane says the Lifer team had lost sight of what should have been their first priority. Prosecutors are sworn to do justice, not to seek convictions. And to my mind, and this is a case that that I've often pointed to as illustrative of this idea, to my mind, it is every bit as important, if not more so, for a prosecutor to protect the innocent than convict the guilty. And I, I truly believe that it is more important to make sure that the criminal justice system doesn't victimize an innocent person than it is ultimately to convict a guilty person. It's that old adage about, you know, 10 p- guilty people go free, um, rather than one innocent person going to, going to prison or, or, or the death penalty. There's no oversight to prosecutors in Texas. They, they have the power to, to basically affect the lives of citizens in pretty detrimental ways, put people in prison, put people on death row. Uh, you know, and, and if you're not motivated properly, ethically, you will damage people. You will end up doing more harm than good. When I told them that, they, their rationalization was nobody was talking to us. They were afraid. Again, in their mind, we know this happened. So when somebody won't talk to us about it, they must either be lying, part of it, or afraid of Scott Ly- or a uh, Little Lifer team, afraid of law enforcement in Upshur County, uh, don't know who's involved. Um, so they, and this is how they put it, we had to show them who had the power. In fact, there's an exchange with Connie or Wanda in, in one of their interviews subsequent to the indictments where they say the response from Connie or Wanda was, we didn't know you had that kind of power. So in their minds, it would let whoever they're talking to, who had information that they wanted, know we're more powerful than what you're afraid of. So you can talk to us. That's why they indicted them. So they were using indictment as a tool for their investigation. Yes, I think that's right. Uh, You know, there was a great deal of ignorance involved in that approach. On March 14th, Shane was back in Gilmer, his first pretrial hearing as the lead prosecutor after taking over for Scott Lyford. Nearly everyone in the courtroom was expecting routine stuff. We went to Gilmer um, for the first setting, basically what was an arraignment, um, on all of the Defendant. So they were all in the courtroom. I'll never forget this. I mean, all in the courtroom, all their lawyers were in the courtroom, and the judge called the case. And I said, Well, judge, at this time, we're going to dismiss everything, which took a lot of people by surprise. They did not expect that. Kidnapping, rape, murder. Just like that, all the charges involving Kelly Wilson, they were gone. Sort of. It is back to square one in the Kelly Wilson case. Good afternoon, everyone. Charges against eight people in the Kelly Wilson case have been dropped. The Attorney General's office moved for a dismissal of the charges due to lack of evidence. Judge James Zimmerman granted the motion this morning, and now eight people, including Sergeant James Brown, Don Holman, Danny Kerr, Eugene Kerr, Geneva Kerr, Wendell Kerr, Tammy Smith, and Wanda Kerr, are no longer suspects in the Kelly Wilson case. The state says the Wilson case remains open. This preliminary hearing originally was scheduled to go over motions by attorneys and to also look at the pretrial order. But after this development, many people are now just scratching their heads in disbelief. I think the judge was actually quoted at some point as saying, I I just had no idea that was coming. Uh, I didn't give anybody any warning and there was no reason to. Raymond's mom, Tammy, was just as clueless. I didn't know it was going to happen. I was sitting in jail and it was lunchtime, and I was sitting right in front of the TV fixing to eat lunch in jail, and all of a sudden, this ticker came on on the bottom of the screen, and it said, all charges in the Gilmer Kelly Wilson case have been, and I remember just thinking, holy shit, we're gonna get out of here. That was on a Monday when Shane dismissed the charges. 
By Friday, Don and Tammy were out of jail on reduced bond. As for the parents of Kelly Wilson, they were split when the case imploded. On one side, Kelly's mom and stepdad. What about reaction tonight from uh, Kelly's parents, the Carlsons? Yeah, we talked with the Carlsons this afternoon, and they said that they were basically stunned. On the other side was Kelly's dad, Robbie. Worked with James pretty close for the last two years. Firstly, my gut feeling is he has no involvement in it. And secondly, we were presented with no evidence that would bear that out. James Brown was a free man. Believe it or not, though, James wasn't thrilled. But what has happened to me to date is a travesty. I have always maintained my innocence and still do. We would have preferred to have been able to have a speed trial in this case. We would have preferred to be able to take Connie Martin's deposition so we can see whether or not uh, you know, she's telling the truth. James Brown and his attorney, David Moore, actually wanted to take the case to trial. Sergeant Brown's reputation had already been so tarnished in Gilmer, he wanted a chance to prove, without a shadow of a doubt, that he was innocent. Not just in a court of law, in the court of public opinion, too. When asked if he would move back to Gilmer, Brown seemed unsure. There's a lot of hurt. Uh, uh, just a lot, there's been a lot of stress. And while Brown is out of jail tonight, the seven others charged in the Wilson case remain behind bars. Several members of the Kerr family and others are still being held charged with several counts of child molestation. But despite that, Danny Kerr today from his jail cell in Upshur County said he was happy to hear charges in the Wilson case were dropped. Well, I'm, I'm more relieved than anything else. It's just like I said, all these murder charges response. I just want to get back my normal life like it's supposed to be. The molestation trial against Raymond's stepdad, Don, was actually scheduled to begin in just a week's time, but the Attorney General's office decided to postpone Don's and all the other molestation cases. Assistant Attorney General Shane Phelps had to regroup. He'd just made a bunch of enemies in Gilmer. Uh, there really was quite a bit of uh, uh, furor about the dismissals, because by this time, the Lifer team had really gathered kind of a following, almost like a cult, um, of people who, who just believe this happened. So again, in their, in their minds, if I step in and dismiss them all, then I'm corrupt. Um, not, this guy's been doing this for a long time, he knows what he's doing, and so on. It was, I'm corrupt, I must be protecting powerful people in, in Upshur County uh, from this information getting out. But I also, you know, made it clear that we were going to devote the full resources of my division and the Attorney General's office to investigating this whole thing, and we would be back before the grand jury. Shane was going to reinvestigate the kidnapping and death of Kelly Wilson, and then he'd take the case back in front of the grand jury. The same grand jury that indicted Sergeant Brown, the Kurs, and Don and Tammy in the first place. But he couldn't hold the grand jury forever. He had three months. Influencer. It's a word that gets tossed around a lot these days. There is a woman who went the distance, who broke ground as the first true influencer by living a remarkable life. Her name, Elizabeth Taylor. I'm Katy Perry. This is the story of the original influencer. This is is Elizabeth the First. Elizabeth the First, the podcast, wherever you listen. Influencer. It's a word that gets tossed around a lot these days. But what exactly is an influencer? Well, there is a woman who went the distance, who went beyond the dazzle, who broke ground as the first true influencer by living a remarkable life. She had power, real power, and longevity, influencing generations. Her name, Elizabeth Taylor. I know she was loud. I know she was hysterically funny. I know she swore, but Elizabeth said how painfully shy she was. She went on perfume tours and the places were mobbed. 
just to see her. She was starting to try and take control of her life, but then tragedy and life kind of got in the way. I'm Katy Perry, and Elizabeth Taylor has fascinated, inspired, and influenced me as an artist, woman, and an advocate. This is the story of the original influencer. This is Elizabeth I. I guess I dismissed the charges in March, and I was back in June. Shane Phelps again. So maybe three months. Um, <laughs> that's all we did. I mean, we devoted thousands of man hours to that case. Um, we work with the FBI, we work with the Sheriff's Department, the Police Department. Um, a big part of that focus was on, is, is James Brown really involved? And we got things like his lawyer provided to us, uh, his personal diary. That, that was clearly his personal diary that recorded, you know, a lot of his investigation into, uh, into Kelly's disappearance. Um, you know, we talked to FBI agents who, who were involved at that early stages and were saying, this guy was doing everything he could to find this girl. Um, uh, police officers he worked with were talking about the fact that he was working around the clock. Uh, the, where, when all this is supposed to have happened, right? He's working with people trying to find this girl while he's allegedly part of this cult that is, you know, where theoretically she was still alive. And so he would work to find her and then go get involved in, I mean, it was just absurd. I, I have no doubt we were able to alibi him 100%. He just had nothing to do with this. Um, I mean, we had his, his, his journal, we had his, he was alibied by, I think at the time, his girlfriend, um, uh, the FBI. Uh, he just didn't have anything to do with that. And, that's, and that made me angry. Uh, because, you know, we're talking about a death penalty case, but we're also talking about them destroying the career of a guy who'd been in law enforcement. I mean, I don't know that James Brown, I mean, he was a sergeant in the Gilmer Police Department. Um, I did not know who he was. I just knew he was a police officer who had been in charge of these crimes. And it became absolutely clear to me over the next 90 days, getting the thing ready to go back to the grand jury, that he didn't have anything to do with it at all, that he was a victim. And as were all these other people, because there was no evidence to support, like Wendell Kerr. I mean, I. I got those original bills of lading and hotel receipts and gas receipts and sent those to the Department of Public Safety Crime Lab, which Scott Lyford could have done. Um, and they confirmed 100%. These are original signatures by Ken Wendell Kerr. And, and I knew when I saw the bills of lading and his exemplar that it was the same guy. It was clear to me, but we sent it to the Department of Public Safety anyway for their forensic handwriting group to take a look at it. And they confirmed <laughs> this, this was Wendell Kerr. He was out of the state the entire time. In June of 1994, Shane Phelps took his findings back to the grand jury in Gilmer. By this time, Shane was so convinced of the suspect's innocence, he did something kind of unusual. He didn't even give the grand jury a chance to reindict Sergeant Brown and the others. The fact is, I wasn't going to present an indictment against people I knew to be innocent of these charges. Um, so I made a decision. I did some things that were somewhat irregular um, in, this, in this whole thing. Um, when the grand jury uh, basically agreed with me, you know, um, I had prepared a statement that I showed the grand jury, and they said, yes. So I had a press conference as soon as we were done. Uh, we were in the courthouse. We had, had been going in and out of the grand jury. Um, I remember the press was just, it was crazy. There was press everywhere. There was, uh, they were following me to the bathroom. It was wild, to the Coke machine. I mean, I couldn't say anything. You know, I'm, I'm not going to make a comment about an ongoing investigation. I'm not going to tell you what happened in the grand jury because it's secret. The reason it's secret. Um, so it was, a, it was a bit of pandemonium attached to all this and a lot of, a lot of tension, a lot of high tension, um, just across the board. It was, it was a bit of a circus, uh, but I understood that people were interested in this case, um, for obvious reasons. Well, he did, did what he said he was going to do. And that was look at it, look at it objectively. And when he did, he, he dismissed the case. 
That's Sergeant Brown's attorney, David Moore, again. In fact, not only did they just dismiss it, he made a, a statement to the media that it wasn't a matter of not having enough evidence, but he said James York Brown is, in fact, an innocent man, which was a stout comment for a prosecutor to make, and uh, I appreciated him doing that. Oh, I remember it quite well. I, I, I think I said James Brown had nothing to do with this. He is innocent. Because I, I, I guess that's kind of a personal thing. Um, I, I think James Brown deserved having somebody in a position of authority tell the rest of the world he didn't have anything to do with it. I know the, the insidious power of an accusation. That is, even if it's disproved, people will still, there are some people out there still believe it. And I kind of slammed the lifer team. People needed to hear that. This was, uh, this was such a disruptive uh, event in the lives of so many people. But James Brown had been accused of brutally raping, torturing, and abducting, and murdering a 17-year-old girl. If I had just gotten in a plane and flown back to Austin, how would he have ever lived that down? Well, that's the, He needed somebody to say that. I mean, one of, there's so many tragedies in this story, but one of the big ones is that so many people in Gilmer still think that James Brown had something to do with this. That's what I say. That's the insidious power of an accusation, particularly a wrongful accusation. Um, and, and those people, you know, fell prey to the same nonsense that I think uh, Scott Lyford did. Because I think in this, Scott Lyford was an experienced, he didn't know how to conduct a criminal investigation. Um, and, and he was swayed by this nonsense he was hearing from bags and flag. Um, and even the victim's mom, Kathy. At, at, at first she said, this, is not, this can't be true. But at some point she was persuaded otherwise. Uh, Kelly's dad never did. I mean, he was relieved when, when James was exonerated and these, and these dis indictments were dismissed. Um, it was, uh, I, you know, you ask the question, you know, why did I do that? Because as I say, it was a fairly irregular thing. Uh, from my perspective, from my moral framework, from my ethical foundation of being a prosecutor, I didn't think I had any other choice. You can't just point the finger at somebody and say horrible things about them, and then when you know you're wrong, not correct it. And and that's that's what we did. Um, and I, to this day, have absolutely no regrets about doing that. Um, I think it was the right thing to do. Shane's decision angered a lot of people in Gilmer. Remember Melvin Dodd, the Gilmer school teacher and co-founder of the Justice for Kelly Wilson Committee? When Melvin read Shane's statement in the newspaper, he immediately called his friend Harvey, who'd sat on the grand jury. Uh, then the charges been dropped. They were dropped by the Texas uh, Attorney General's office. Mm -hmm. And there was a statement in there they said that they were acting on behalf of the grand jury. I, I, I'm trying to think of the name of the man from the attorney general's office who, in my opinion, is a total scumbag. Shane Phelps? Shane, yeah, Shane Phelps. So I read Harvey Rayson this statement where Shane Phelps said that the grand jury requested that they drop the charges. This is the way Harvey Rayson spoke to me. Melvin, the grand jury took no action. So Harvey Rayson was saying that that was a lie. The grand jury absolutely did not ask Shane Phelps and Lisa Tanner in the attorney general's office to drop the charges. But our relations dead now. So he uh, he was not convinced then to drop the charges. He he would have. No, he was upset that the charges were dropped. Now we had on the south side of the courthouse in Gilmer a 
rally called Justice for Kelly Wilson. And I think, I didn't go around counting, but I think we probably had over 500 people there. You know, a little bit of knowledge about the criminal justice system can be dangerous. So everybody assumed that because the grand jury didn't no-bill it, that that means that there must have been something going on, that I fooled the grand jury and all that, which is nonsense. The Justice for Kelly Wilson committee would go on to hold a bunch of rallies. They even protested outside the attorney general's office in Austin, but their protests went nowhere. To this day, many Gilmer residents believe Shane was part of a conspiracy to protect evildoers. And Gore, the CPS caseworker who uncovered the abuse in the Kerr home, is among them. And um, I, I talked to Ann Gore. She wouldn't talk uh, for the recorder, but she still professes to believe that, um, you know, she, she thinks she was in the right. You know, she thinks that she was like following this holy crusade or something. You know, I, I suppose... You know, I can't speak for Ann Gore. Um, I suppose when you get so invested in something being true that caused so much damage that I guess from a psychological perspective, you just can't admit you were wrong. Um, I, I feel sorry for her. Uh, you know, laboring under a, a you know, an apprehension that is just not true. We know it not to be true. And yet in her mind, for the rest of her life, she's going to think it was and some horrible things happened. And the, in terms of, of, you know, killers getting away with it, uh, people in power, protecting other people in power. I mean, it is a fantasy world that she lives in that I guess she just can't disabuse herself of, which is, which is tragic. And then the injustice of, um, you know, there was actual abuse that was kind of papered over, you know, because it morphed into this crazy it, thing. It, and, and Ann Gore and Debbie Minshew and Brooke Slag and Scott or Steve Beggs and Scott Lyford are responsible for the people who abuse those kids never being held responsible. It's their fault. Because they contaminated those children to the extent that those children could never be credible in a court of law. I mean, you can imagine the cross-examination when we start talking about, well, you also saw those penis-shaped elevators, didn't you? Yeah. And nobody would believe them. I mean, these children were horribly manipulated. And they were destroyed in terms of their credibility. And, and frankly, how much damage did it do to these kids? It did a ton of damage. To evaluate Raymond and the Kerr kids, the state of Texas hired a noted psychiatrist named Bruce Perry. His research focuses on the long-term effects of trauma in children, and he's been an expert witness in a number of high-profile incidents, including the Oklahoma bombing and the Columbine massacre. You know, one of the reasons that Bruce Perry came into the picture was to try and deal with these children, to try and sort this out. Can, can these cases be salvaged? And, and the bottom line was, no, it could not be salvaged. And that was hard, you know. But again, you walk away as a good prosecutor from a case, even though you may believe that the person is guilty. But if it has been so compromised because of misconduct and the credibility of the children has been so destroyed, you may not like it, but you have no choice. You have to walk away. And that's what happened in that case. Um, we had to dismiss, and I had already left the AG's office when it happened, but we all knew it was going to happen. That was one of our biggest concerns was, is there any way to salvage these cases against these people who may or may not have? I mean, I can't tell you at this point. I believe something happened. I believe there was some validity in those original cases, but it was all just lost in all of this other nonsense. So not only was the search for Kelly Wilson lost in the hysteria, there was very little doubt that at least some members of the Kerr family had abused their own kids. In those cases, they were ruined too. But there was a bright side. Don and Tammy hadn't done anything wrong. Their son Raymond had been pressured into making up abuse claims against them. For all this time, 
Don and Tammy had been waiting for justice too. Folks in Gilmer were split on their guilt or innocence. Somebody took a spray paint and spray painted a big M on my car from Lester. He had a big Cadillac, maroon Cadillac, and I mean this huge M spray painted all over my Cadillac. So much stuff that went on and people were so hateful. Big old gold limb written across the back of it. And people told me how to get it off. I said, I ain't getting it off. I drove around town with it on there. I mean, like, you want to call me name? I said, now it's gone now. It finally wore off. Don was also fielding anonymous phone calls. Like, hey, yeah, who's this? Well, I just saw you on TV, and I thought you was good looking, and and uh, I'd like to get to know you. And I said, well, I got me a woman, and I'm faithful to her. Well, okay. And one of them said, hey, you you that guy that likes to eat women? You know, mm-hmm. and, well, kill, then eat them. Don tries to make light of things now, but the legal limbo was clearly taking a toll. We got a court date, and then they cancel it. Now we got a court date, and then they cancel it. And I mean, my nerves were just shot. And I remember one day I broke down crying so hard, right in the middle of work. And I was a cashier at a convenience store, and there was it was full. And I remember this guy walked up to me, he goes, "Baby, we've been watching you for years." He goes, "You've been so strong." He said, "Don't give up now." And I just. I was like, you don't know. You just don't know. He goes, no, we know. We're so proud of you. And it was just like a lift me up. You know what I mean? Like the stranger guy knew who I was. I didn't even know if they knew. Because that was the embarrassing part. You don't know who knows who you are, (laughs) you know? And I always felt I had an obligation when I'd meet new people. I needed to tell them right off who I was. Now, thanks to the bungling of Scott Lyford's team and the CPS caseworkers, the molestation charges were gone. Don and Tammy were free and clear. But Raymond, he was still trapped in foster care. And Kelly was still missing. Devil Town is a production of Imperative Entertainment. It was written and created by me, Wes Ferguson. Executive producer is Jason Hoke. Audio engineering and editing by Shane Freeman and Jason Hoke. Original score is by Robert Ellis. Recording by Austin Sisler at Eastside Studios. If you like the show, leave a review and don't forget to tell your friends. Thanks for listening.